great pleasure for Afghan Afghans to come back every other week and interact with this particularly vigilant and attentive public that the program is simply thrilled uh, to be environed by. Uh, this time, uh, what African Arts Center has decided to do is to bring you a young, uh, vibrant, uh, very intelligent art historian who would be examining one of the most uh, perennial themes in African historical quarters, namely the business of authenticity, inauthenticity, scandals, forgeries, and uh, facts. Uh, my guest by now uh, must be quite familiar uh, with my particular vigilant audience. He has been here before. He has treated us to a rigorous analysis of art historic themes in the past, and he's going to do it again. And uh, tonight um, I have asked him uh, to speak in great detail, uh, details that I know uh, are going to result in our own uh, historical elucidation uh, about the meanings of authenticities, inauthenticities, uh, thefts and scandals as they rock the art historical world. Uh, my guest, or rather African Ascent's guest, is Professor Ross Bressler, uh, a young scholar uh, at, at, um, at Cambridge College of uh, Music. And uh, I am delighted, uh, for example, uh, to share with you that he happens to be the recipient of a most recent uh, prestigious award at Berklee College of Music uh, that is given to uh, great teachers. Uh, congratulations, and Thank I would you. like to uh, share this uh, success about my colleague with my audience uh, out there. As I have told you in the past, I will have to repeat it again, although he doesn't uh, really require uh, further introductions. He's a graduate of two uh, conspicuous universities, Indiana University, uh, in which he studied uh, history uh, when he was uh, considerably younger, in his undergraduate days, that is. Uh, an interest that he pursued and then decided to inventively blend with art history. Uh, the combination, of course, is uh, this uh, spectacular uh, vocation called uh, art history. Mm -hmm. Welcome to African Art Center. Thank you very Professor much for Bresley. having me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what I, uh, I thought we should do, uh, now that I have uh, uh, mentioned, um, which, uh, uh, as you know, is uh, a rather uh, important theme these days, mm -hmm. uh, this business of uh, authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, I'm sure you do, uh, the term authenticity, uh, authenticity uh, has a, um, a, a particular vibrancy uh, with philosophers such as Satra. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, there, uh, it is used to, 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 to capture uh, that which the self or the person uh, originates in his mm -hmm or her soul, which mm. then becomes uh, projected uh, to the products that the uh, person um, produces. Mm. Uh, it could be a piece of uh, writing, it could be a painting, um, um, it could be any of the plastic arts, it could be music, so forth and so on. I'm sure to, to, to art historians, informed art historians mm. such as you, uh, the term um, authenticity um, mm. uh, is also um, uh, rigorously uh, important. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Uh, you are right, and, and I should say, um, uh, just by way of introduction uh, to the viewers, that the, the choice of tonight's topic um, uh, came about as I'm going to be offering a new course at Berkeley College of Music this summer uh, that will focus specifically on uh, our notions of authenticity in the visual arts, how that relates to uh, a very long history of the creation of uh, forgeries of works of art. Um, how that relates to the importance of theft of works of art. And it's a topic that has always come up in the classes uh, that I've taught in the past, but just in small bits and pieces. And um, uh, several students over the course of the years have always sort of encouraged me to focus specifically on this topic um, uh, in its own sort of concrete course form. Um, and so this summer is the first time that, that, that I'm going to be doing it, and I'm very, very excited. And uh, the, the whole idea of authenticity has... Um, uh, many different uh, attributes. Um, whether I can look at this cup that's sitting on the table and say this cup was made in the year 1990 or this is an ancient cup made in, in, in imperial China thousands of years ago, 
um, that's going to change very much the way that we look at that cup that's on the table. Mm -hmm. um, it looks exactly the same uh, to me sitting here looking at it as it does to you looking at it visually in the room uh, that we sit in, the space that we share. Uh, how we define what that thing is. Right? Is it 2,000 years old or was it made last week? Is going to change dramatically the way that we consider the space that we're in, the importance of that black object that's sitting there on that table. And uh, one of the things that I'm hoping to explore this summer with students is uh, really the whole idea of when we walk into a museum gallery and we walk up to an object. Uh, you know, is it the label that we look at first or is it the object that we look at first? And I think that it's part of our human nature to look first at who the creator was of this object and then we look at what is created. And one of the fascinating things, and there's been studies that have been done on this, is you know, what happens if that painting that's in front of you and the label next to it says Rembrandt, mm -hmm. you know, the most famous painter that's ever lived in the Western tradition, you could argue. And all of a sudden, that little label doesn't say Rembrandt anymore, but it says Rembrandt with a little question mark that's after it. Mm -hmm. And does that affect the way that we look at the same object? That is, if I've just spent an hour speaking very eloquently about how wonderful this painting is and the brush stroke and the use of color and all of these things, and you have an enraptured audience, and you say, this is a Rembrandt painting, and then all of a sudden, well, it might be by Rembrandt. You know, how, how does that affect the way we think about that object? The, the object itself hasn't changed. The notion of who has created that object has changed. Huh? And by extension, our relationship with that object changes with it, even though I think we would like to believe that the object has a life of its own, that, it's, that we can approach it no matter who the creator was. We can be moved by it, we can be horrified by it, we can be bored by it that is, in some respects, completely divorced from its creator. Um, but I think that that's not the case. We're human beings. We want to go see a really bad, poorly preserved Rembrandt much more than we would like to go and see a really well-preserved 17th century painting by someone we've never heard of. Um, that there is a, the, the importance of who has, uh, a, what the origin of what is being created is essential. Um, and this is what makes the idea of, uh, so trying to make sure that we can understand what is an original of something. Is it authentic? Um, you know, does it take us back on that time travel trip back to you know, the 1620s in Holland? Uh, becomes so important. Um, it becomes important aesthetically. It comes, uh, becomes important experientially. Um, and at the end of the day, I know that we'll, we'll get around to talking about these things, it's, uh, it is a commercial journey. Um, and objects here on the table that was bought at, uh, at Target would cost me $4.99. Um, if that was a 2,000-year-old ceramic mug from an ancient Roman uh, port town, and this went up uh, for sale at auction, this would be several thousand dollars. That the, the, the financial um, uh, sort of environment when you deal with questions of authenticity is absolutely enormous. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking of um, if this too, um, uh, Ross? Uh, who determines if a mm -hmm. particular art object mm -hmm. is authentic or mm -hmm. inauthentic? Is it the expert? Mm -hmm. Is it the seasoned viewers? Mm -hmm. Is it a mass of undifferentiated audience mm -hmm. who are simply interested in looking at art objects? Or is it a combination of all three, A, B, C? Well, I mean, I think that there are, there are many things. So let, let's just take an example. So okay. let's say we are sitting here in this room. Someone walks in and drops a painting in front of us. Okay. And, and they're trying to tell us that this is something that was made 500 years ago. Uh, let's say it's painted using oil uh, and it's on a wooden support. Okay. And the question is, how do we determine if this is, in fact, a painting from the year 1500? Science can tell us a lot. Right? If it's made on wood, um, we can date the wood. Right? We can use dendrochronology, which is tree rings, uh, to help us get at least a relative date of the wood. Um, there are other tests that scientists can do in, to determine the age, for example. You can do what's called carbon-14 dating. Uh, and essentially that relies upon a principle that everything that is alive, right, me, you, a plant, um, which is organic, has carbon in it. Right? And when we die, or a plant dies, right, or a tree dies, the carbon in that once living organic thing will deteriorate at a measurable rate. Mm -hmm. 
And so you can test something that was once alive, which could be a human being, or it can be um, wood, or it can be certain um, uh, pigments, for example, that are mixed with egg, right? An egg being an organic substance. And you can test those things to see how much radioactive carbon is inside of them to give you a relative idea of when that thing died. I see. Right? Mm -hmm. And so that can be helpful. Uh, the further back in time you go, the greater the degree of, of um, plus or minus um, doubt becomes. So if you're dating something that's 20,000 years old, that plus or minus can be 1,000 years, a uh, degree of uncertainty. Um, if it was something from 1500, we'd probably be able to get within five or six years or so using both dendrochronology. If it's on wood, you can do carbon dating. Um, scientists um, and conservators, when they're looking at old objects, will also look at pigments. Right? That if we can create a chronology of when certain pigments were first introduced, um, and this is a painting that says that it's from 1500, but it uses a color blue, whose pigment was not known until the year 1600, then we would have uh, cause to be concerned. Uh, or conservators would have cause to be concerned. Um, so there are lots of chemical tests that you can apply, both to the physical object, also, again, to make sure that all of the materials that are being used are appropriate to the time in which they are said to have been painted. Um, but that only goes so far, right? That is, even if everything that's on there dates appropriately, we used all of our scientific tools to tell us that this is something that feels like it's 1500. Um, well, what we also know is that people who are creating fake objects know that all of these tests are going to be done. And so they will take appropriate steps to use only pigments that would have been available at the time in which these were made, to maybe go out and find a really old, battered, beat up painting from 1500 at an auction, and then strip its surface so that the wood itself will date to the appropriate time. Um, and it's not only the year 1500. So for example, if you look at, um, I don't know, let's say a carved piece of ivory, Right. And, you know, a statue made out of, uh, out of ivory, elephant tusk, walrus tusk. And you can date the actual object. You can date the physical materials because it was once alive. You say, this is a 2,000-year-old piece of ivory. Well, that tells you that the ivory is 2,000 years old. It doesn't tell you that the carving is 2,000 years old. And so science, in many contexts, can only do so much. It can tell you if something is painted in acrylic, and it was meant to be painted 700 years ago when they didn't have that uh, kind of material, you can you know, be pretty certain that it's inauthentic. Um, but even if all of the materials check out, that's only the beginning part of the process. The second part of the process would be art historians. That's, you know, people who have an in-depth understanding of that period, who have spent their lives focused on what a painting from the year 1500 by this artist or by this sort of school would look like. Um, they've spent their lives in museums, they've spent their lives in classrooms, and once the science of it checks out, then the art history kicks in. Does the painting appear to be of this age stylistically? Um, is the space right? Is the handling of the paint the way that we would expect it to be from this artist or this period or from this period in this artist's career? And one of the interesting things is that once the art historians get involved, in many ways you are moving from what you could argue is an objective science. This has red pigment that dates to 1400. I can clearly, with a scientific instrument, tell you when it's dated. To something that, at the end of the day, is subjective. So let's say you're a scholar on a 15th century painting. I'm a scholar on a 15th century painting. I look at it and say, there's no way that that guy painted that. The ears are all wrong. He would never paint a knee like that. The space is unsuccessful. The composition is awkward. And then you come in and say, I disagree with you. In fact, I think that that composition fits in very well with the youthful period of this artist, whatever it is. Uh, and the difference between our opinions is subjective. I mean, it's based on a lot of experience that I will have had as an art historian in that period, on your experience as an art historian of that period, and we can fundamentally disagree on whether or not this object is authentic stylistically. And all of the scientific data can check out, and we can still disagree, that, that, that at some point there is a large role that is played by, uh, I guess we can still call it, sort of connoisseurship. Um, I know what a Rembrandt painting looks like, because That's I've fine. spent my whole career looking at Rembrandt, and when I look at this, something doesn't work for me. It doesn't feel right. 
Um, it could be in spirit, it could be in brushstroke, um, it could be very small things. Rembrandt in the 1630s never finished his R with that kind of curly Q. That didn't come in until the early 1640s. It could be a range of things. Um, but when you start to introduce the subjective into the conversation about authenticity, um, it becomes a much different ball game. And again, that can have both uh, consequences for, um, and I'll give you two examples. Let's say this is an object that hangs in your museum, the, the, the Dr. Teodros Kiros Museum. And you purchase that object for $1,000 and it hangs on your wall. And I, as the art historian, come in and say, well, I've done the testing. All the materials check out. But aesthetically, it doesn't feel right. And so I am not going to lend my uh, authorial uh, sort of supports to this as an authentic object, whatever it is. Um, your museum is now a much different place. Right? That that object which held pride of place in the central foyer when we walk into the Kiros Museum as a wonderful Picasso or Rembrandt or Raphael or whatever it is, once the art historian comes in and says, guess what? Not by Rembrandt. Maybe someone who was around him, but not by Rembrandt. That means the prestige of your institution has now changed. That means financially that this object that may have been worth $10 million might now be worth $5,000. Right? So that the, these subjective pointing of the fingers, that is authentic, that is inauthentic, that is autographed to the master, that is the product of his students, have really wide-ranging ramifications. And again, not all of those pointing of the fingers are based on objective science, that there still is today a great deal of authority that is placed in authority. I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Of course. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in fact, uh, in that light, um, uh, as, I, uh, as you were speaking, uh, I was also thinking uh, uh, about a question that I could ask you. Uh, suppose uh, that uh, in a remote um, African village uh, to which a Western trained um, uh, African intellectual uh, who has frequented museums uh, for quite a long time mm -hmm. when he was um, in the West returns home. And then one day on a Sunday afternoon, someone quite well-dressed, attractive, reliable-looking salesman walks in to one of the cafes in which this intellectual was sitting and shows him a still life by Cezanne. He swears that this is an authentic Cezanne, and he buys it for huge amounts of money. Is this autobiographical? I love this story. Please tell me this is for real. No, and I'm merely uh, asking a question. Uh, I'm waiting to see your saison <laughs> above, your, uh, above your dining room table. Mm. As a matter of mm. fact, uh, it's just a question that uh, popped into my mind as you were speaking about uh, authenticity and its opposite. Mm. So Would you trust this um, the, the, the particular intellectual who professes uh, to have an intimate knowledge of art history. He studied it, he specialized in it, but he's not really, strictly speaking, an artist, an art historian, uh, but a very well-informed uh, connoisseur. Mm -hmm. And then he purchases this uh, still life by uh, Cezanne. Then one day, he go back to that village uh, by accident, uh, and he meet with this person, and he invites him in to his living room to proudly show you the still life by Cezanne. And within 10, 15 minutes of looking at it, uh, consistent with the, with, the, with, the, with the conversation that we're having, uh, you determine uh, on some kind of ground, uh, I suppose on the grounds of authenticity, mm, that this is not Cezanne. It's a brilliant forgery, brilliant. It approximates the original uh, that has the oeuvre of, of, the, of a Cezanne, but it's only nominally the case. It just fits certain empirical details of what a Cezanne still life looks like. But you determine that um, it's not Cezanne. Mm. Now, who sh whom should we believe? The informed member of the audience who thinks that he is both a Cezanne and has had this particular still life for 20 years? or the expert, namely you, who's going to come to tell him the good news 
<laughs> but he doesn't have a Cezanne. He has something else. So uh, can I ask a question before I answer that? Yes, of course. So is the, the remote village setting important to this question? That is, could we have transplanted this to New York, Belgium, anywhere? Or is that is the, the strangeness of being in a remote African village and coming across a Cezanne part of your question? It is part of the question. Okay. It's a, uh, that's a very smart question. Mm -hmm against the question that you have <laughs> asked me, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm also trying to ask you to, to, to assess the role that the audience plays in, in the determination of the value uh, of a work of art. Um, I would dive, in the, dive into this question in two ways. And one would be the remoteness of the village. And so, you know, already uh, uh, this, this late afternoon, early evening, um, we have delved into sort of two important things to think about when you have this object in front of you. One is the scientific data that's at our disposal. What can we test? What can we measure with this physical thing that's in front of us? Secondly is the connoisseur. Feels like, looks like, the way the knees are painted, the composition, all of that stuff. Um, your question sort of leads us to the I guess the third leg of this tripod, if you want to think about it that way, that is of fundamental importance, which is what is the history of that object and how do we know it? Right? And this is what is called the object's provenance. Right? And so a Cezanne that falls from the sky, right, that has no paperwork with it, right? it's no sense of this was owned by Jacques Smith in Paris, who sold it to Jean, who bought it from this one, who sold it to there, and then it came to me, to my family. Right? That if I don't have that trail, right, if it comes from the void, right, this is very challenging right, in terms of taking something that is previously unknown, right, that's never been photographed, that's never been written about, that has no documentary trail whatsoever. Um, this makes it very difficult for that object to be sort of universally accepted if there's no paper trail, if there's no, if there's no provenance. Um, the, the second part of that, we can talk about provenance, which is actually a very interesting uh, sort of element to, to the conversations that we're having. Um, but the other bit of sort of who holds the most authority, is it a general audience? Is it, is it the art experts? Um, unfortunately, well, maybe I shouldn't put it that way. I think that at the end of the day, it is the art experts. Mm -hmm. right? That when someone of some authority in whatever subject has come out and declared that this is not what it purports to be, um, that is very difficult to get around. Right? And uh, whether it's in terms of financial value, whether it's in terms of prestige, that favorite painting of yours by Manet that you used to go and visit as a kid in that museum in Philadelphia that no longer is a Manet, right? that is now by some, that, that we found out that was painted in 1932 by some guy in his basement. It doesn't take away your childhood memories of the painting. It doesn't take away those moments that, that, uh, that you spent with it and the way it sort of informed uh, how you evolved as a person. Um, it is no longer a Manet though. Right? And for as much as you still love that painting, uh, you know, a 10-year-old who is walking into that museum today doesn't see that as a Manet. He could be equally as moved by it. Right? But the sort of the linking of that object to this well-known artist who has an established place within the canon has been severed. Uh, and that's very difficult to patch back into the fabric um, once it's been taken out. And, uh, you know, as we mentioned before when talking about connoisseurs, that it is not unusual, it's probably more common that there's disagreement over authenticity. And generally it refers, um, that kind of scholarly agreement, or excuse me, disagreement, is more about whether a painting is by the master or the student, much more frequently than it is um, about is this real or not, is this authentic or not. Um, generally the, the authenticity um, of whether it is a genuine Norman Rockwell or a genuine Manet, um, you, uh, you know, once the sort of evidence begins to emerge and you have established scholars who will present their ideas, I mean, sometimes they'll sort of fight with one another. Mostly it has to do with, is this painted by Renoir or one of his students? Is this a Picasso or a close follower of Picasso? Um, and then it becomes much trickier to be able to discern 
um, uh, sort of traces of authenticity, signatures, style, how it relates to that period in their work, the sciences, as we've talked about. Um, but I guess that the, the largest response I would have to the question has to do with the problem of the history of the object. That this is an essential element um, for museums um, who have whole departments that are devoted only to researching the histories of the objects in their collection and those, um, if, a, if a museum is going to be investing millions of dollars in new acquisitions, um, if there's not an appropriate provenance for that object, it's really almost a non-starter. That if you can't document the history um, of an object with some kind of um, definitive uh, you know, biography, uh, it becomes very difficult to invest a lot of uh, funding in the, to bring that into your institution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I know you've done um, um, uh, very impressive work, uh, which, which I gleaned from our first interview mm -hmm. on um, ancient Egypt, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, the other day, uh, called it silly, uh, perhaps the dimension of it indeed is silly. Mm -hmm. But when I visited with the um, section where um, the um, Egyptian mummies mm -hmm. uh, are placed, uh, about which you lamented, uh, you commented on the physical conditions or the environment in which the mummies are placed. Um, I would go on public on, on this uh, television program uh, and complain how depressing the setting in which the mummies are. I wonder if that um, depressing uh, comportment that just uh, uh, insinuates myself uh, is a function of the condition under which the, the mummies are being placed? Or is it a function of the very fact that these mummies are being placed inside museums? Yeah. I was wondering about this the other day. <laughs> uh, I was wondering uh, even more um, about the role of the lightning system mm -hmm. at the museums and the way it impacts the way in which I receive the mummies when I go to visit with them. Or am I saying all this uh, because I'm not authentically trained as an art historian, that I don't know what I'm talking about? That was very elegant, the way you worked authentic into that sentence. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, I, I think that the the setting within which we experience things uh, is essential. It, it, it completely informs the way that we try to make sense of what we're looking at, or what we're listening to, for that matter. Yes. And, uh, you know, for example, the two of us right now could go to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, take probably the majority of the things that are hanging on those walls, take off the frames, and hang them on these walls here, or out in the hallway, mm -hmm. and watch how many people walk by those things. Nice. Oh yeah, that's a pretty painting. Walk right by it. That's nice. Walk right by it. Because in the hallway of the television studio here, you are not expecting great art, that which has been anointed as being important to be in the hallowed sort of halls of the museum. And you know, the lighting in, in, in the case of the, of the mummy exhibits that you're talking about is, is very deliberate as a way of recreating the sort of the dark, mysterious, tomb-like womb from which these things came. And we are being manipulated. I see. And uh, I, I'm not quite as bothered by the, uh, uh, by the darkness in there. Um, but, you know, if you took those same mummies and you put them in a brightly spotlit room like this, um, it would have a different effect on us. And uh, you know, one, one of the interesting things is that when I'm uh, in the classroom and I'm bring, putting together imagery, um, and it's much more poignant with sculpture, uh, when I'm trying to use two-dimensional reproductions of three-dimensional things, uh, sort of teaching about you know, Michelangelo or whoever it is, that when you're looking at, especially photographs of sculpture, the, the way that those photographs, excuse me, the way that those objects are photographed can completely change the way these things look. Right? Are they dramatically spotlit? Is it dark from the left or from the right? Uh, is it photographed from an angle from below with the light coming from this way or the other way? How does that affect the stone or the color of the object? 
And so even in an art history class, when you've got these images up on the wall, the, the, the reproductions that I am choosing right, can dramatically influence the way that my students understand what I'm presenting to them based on which photographs I'm choosing, which lighting of Michelangelo's David am I using. I Is it one in mid-morning? Is it one when they've closed the museum down, have everything else blacked out and a big spotlight coming down because it changes everything. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting, I mean, that this is certainly not unique to, to painting. And there was a, I can't remember how long ago this was, this maybe four or five years ago, that the violinist whose name is Joshua Bell, right, virtuoso violinist, was in Washington, I believe, if memory serves. And he was playing at the Kennedy Center. And, uh, you know, people paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to come and hear this guy play. And so he spent the day in the subway system, right, as a busker, right, on the subway tracks wearing jeans and a t-shirt, playing the exact same performance Amazing. that he was going to be playing that night with a hat. Amazing. Right? And I think, uh, and again, I'd have to go back um, uh, and reread the, the, the coverage of this, but my memory is, is that only one person recognized him and gave him 20 bucks or something like that. But that in total, he got like $30. He was there all day playing the exact same performance that he was playing that night, where people are going to be putting on a jacket and a tie, and they're in this hall within which they are prepared to be moved by great music. But when you're in the subway with your newspaper under one arm and a cup of coffee, and there's noise all over, and there's a guy sitting there playing music, you don't expect for that to be an authentic, you know, uh, awe-inspiring moment. And so you walk by it. And I think that museums on how things are hung, how they're illuminated, what frames are used to surround those objects, uh, are very influential in how we perceive greatness, quality, imports, uh, that a lot of that we are being seduced for its importance. We're supposed to be quiet and hushed voices and talk about these things that are there. Um, and how things are hung, lit, framed, play an essential role in that, certainly. I see. And uh, when I was looking at um, your um, uh, um, syllabus for mm -hmm. the course, I was genuinely impressed with the thematics of it. Mm -hmm. uh, two parts mm -hmm. uh, that um, uh, respectively uh, promise to analyze. Mm -hmm. Forgeries and scandals mm -hmm. attracted my attention. Uh, and this is the two-tiered question. Yeah. We can collapse it into one if you want. Um, but um, I'm analytically trained. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer breaking things. So we might want to talk first about forgeries and then scandals, okay. if you agree. Sure. Uh, if you think the, the two cannot be analytically separated, then we might want to talk about forgeries slash scandals at mm -hmm. the same time. You break it. You are the expert. You decide. Uh, well, no, I, 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 and, and some of this goes back to my own uh, work as a graduate student, where um, I wrote my, uh, my PhD dissertation on Renaissance copies of ancient Roman coins, right? Right. and also of ancient Roman objects in general. Um, and one of the interesting things that I found was that it seemed to be this moment, um, really about in, in the 16th century, where sort of leading up to that, the way that you as an artist would demonstrate your greatness, right? the way you would demonstrate the, the level of your skill, right? the depth of your sophistication as an artist, that one of the measuring sticks for that was your ability to create things that looked so much like ancient Roman objects that they were confused for them. Right? That in an age where the language of the Romans was sort of set up on a pedestal as the greatest that there was, the model by which we should be sort of striving uh, to achieve, that if you could pass off your own work as ancient, that you were considered to be a great artist. Uh -huh. And then at some point, right in this period, there was a switch that was made between prioritizing the creativeness, the inventiveness, right, right, the individual who creates something new, right, 
as opposed to who can create something that looks just like someone else. Nice. And that switchover was very interesting to me. That is, within a generation, you had artists who were praised uh, as the greatest artist of the day right, because of their ability to be mistaken or the, their work to be mistaken for Roman objects. And one of those examples is Michelangelo. Right, that Michelangelo, if we believe the sources, essentially gets his first job, right, his first big important commission, after he had carved out of marble a little statue of Cupid asleep, right, a little baby sort of sleeping Cupid. And then according to, to the sources, and they differ uh, slightly in the details, but the statue eventually was sold as an ancient Roman statue, right, and not by this teenager who made it in Florence. Some people, some of the sources suggest that Michelangelo buried it in the backyard so that it would look appropriately dirty and a little bit scuffed up, and that made it um, easier to sell. Um, the person who buys it, when they find out that it was, in fact, made by a living person, was not so happy, but then figured whoever could make something that is so much like the ancients must be a great sculptor. And so he brings him to Rome and hires him to make a statue there. That is sort of advanced through your ability to mimic so closely Right. the language of that which had been deemed culturally to be the greatest, that, that that's a very good thing. Um, and even within Michelangelo's own lifetime, again, we're dealing here in the 1500s and the 16th century, there's a sort of a switch over to that is not, in fact, a really good thing. That is a misleading, deceptive forgery. <laughs> uh, and this is, this is within a generation. Mm -hmm. right? And some of that has to do with the intent of the artist. Right? That is, are they making things to be sold? Right, as something that they are not for financial gain. Right? Does that create a distinction between artists who just are working in a style in emulation of something um, from, from an earlier period? But it's really at this, uh, at this time, again, in the, in, in the 1500s, in the mid to late 16th century, um, where the whole notion of a, of a forgery, at least in, in the sort of modern um, uh, Western European world, is sort of born again that sense of artists who are creating things and developing tricks to make things look old, I patinas see. on their surfaces, um, uh, you know, breaking things in very uh, convenient places so that, that they will look appropriately old. Um, and so we are going to be spending a lot of time in, in this course over the summer, um, and again, uh, being offered in the fall. This is not an advertisement. There are, the both classes are it's full. All right. <laughs> Sorry. <advertise> it. um, <laughs> uh, already, uh, spending a lot of time looking at um, sort of famous examples of forgeries, um, and uh, you know, the, uh, trying to make sense as best we can of why forgers are born, uh, or, or why they do what they do. Is it always about money? Um, in some cases, that is certainly uh, uh, certainly true. Um, to create objects that can sell for, uh, for a large amount of uh, financial return through, through little investment. Uh, that is certainly a big part of it. Um, in other cases, we have forgers who were unsuccessful painters or unsuccessful sculptors in their own right. And so by working in the style of famous artists and having their work accepted as those famous artists, is a way of sort of validating their talent, right? That their own work and their own language was not accepted. And so, but my Cezanne that I painted, right, was bought as a Cezanne. And they go to the auctions and watch their work being sold as, a, you know, as by an old master, by an impressionist painter. And there certainly sort of psychologically is that sort of cast of forgers that it seeks validation through having their work being accepted as those of great masters. Uh, and there's a very long and interesting history of this. And, and, and the one example that, that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about um, uh, in this course that I'm teaching, which is a very, very well-known example um, of a Dutch artist uh, by the name of Hans van Meegeren. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, you know, do you know the Hans yeah, van course, Meegeren story? In, in that piece that I that read this afternoon. Yes. Oh, oh, it's, a, it's, it's right. a fantastic story who is uh, an unsuccessful painter in his own right. I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story in brief. Who, during the war, uh, it's when Holland is occupied uh, uh, by Germany, sells a series of paintings to the Germans. Right? Paintings um, of uh, mostly 17th century Dutch painters, and sort of golden age of Dutch painting, and several by the painter Johannes Vermeer, who's an incredibly talented painter. Um, we have very few paintings by Vermeer that survive. I think we have 
memory serves, 42 known paintings by Vermeer, uh, which is not a lot. And Van Meegeren is selling these off to the Germans while Holland is being occupied. So the war ends, Van Meegeren is arrested as a Nazi collaborator, Nazi sympathizer. And his defense was at the time considered to be a really outrageous one, which is, no, I have not in fact sold off the patrimony of Holland because all of those Vermeers, I painted them. Not the original thing. No one believes him. Um, and so, and this is brilliant. So he's put in jail, right, and given canvas and paint. And to prove that he, in fact, did paint all of these earlier fakes, um, he paints a Vermeer in prison, right? And that is presented at the trial. This, you know, here is this thing that, that, that I painted. Uh, and it's an, ex it's an extraordinary story. And today, there is a Van Meegeren Museum in Holland where you can go and visit a museum of early 20th century fakes of 17th century Dutch originals, which is in and of itself a fascinating thing that that exists. And that, that, that story, which is a very rich one, we only have time to, to, to scratch the surface and talking about it here, that one of those paintings um, came from what purported to be an early period in Vermeer's career. Um, which is a period that we don't know a lot about. We have few paintings that survive that come from this sort of early moment. And one of his forgeries was meant to sort of fill this hole in the art historical scholarship. And when it arrived, all of the leading scholars on Vermeer, I mean, these are, we talked earlier about, the, you know, the authority of the authority. I mean, the big guns, like the world's leading scholars, came out and said, this is an incredible advance for our understanding of Dutch painting. Clearly, this is a work by the early Vermeer. Clearly, it has all of the characteristic that we expected it to have, you know, even though we have this void in what we know. Um, and when Van Meegeren comes out, it, it essentially destroys the career of several scholars. Uh, two of the most, you know, sort of the, the, the loudest voices in claiming that, that, that these things were authentic. Um, and so, uh, you know, what I hope to do and again, I know that, that, that I said this to you um, as, as we were getting ready for tonight, is that, um, that there are so many great questions about these things and very few good answers. Like what? Um, and so, you know, the, the questions of why is it I want to go to a museum of Hans van Meegeren copies of 17th century Dutch paintings is a really complex question. Do I want to go because it's a great story? Right? And when I go there, will I look at the paintings to see if I too would be tricked? Or do I look at them and try to make sense of Van Meegeren as an artist? Right? Am I even thinking about him as a creator or just as a clever copyist who knew what pigments to use, who knew exactly where the holes in the scholarship were? And is my experience in that museum different than if I go to the Louvre in Paris and I look at an actual Vermeer? Like the whole, all the conversations that are going on in my head are very different. Um, and why is that? You know, and, and what are the, the, the elements that if I look at an object like this and say, you now are holding in your hand an ancient Roman mug. Oh, this is so cool. I can't believe I'm holding this thing that's 2,000 years old. I can't, I'm not even going to drink out of it. Oh, by the way, I bought it at Target. Oh, well, okay, well then, yeah, it's no problem. I mean, that, that, that whole sort of illumination that this is something that is more, that, that is less special, not as old, not made by a famous person, um, changes the way that, that, that I would hold this in my hand. Probably wouldn't even hold it if it was a 2,000-year-old Roman mug. Um, so we are going to spend a lot of time exploring those kinds of issues. Yeah. You know, why people make things um, uh, that are fake. Um, is it always for financial gain? Is it for their own validation? Um, and there are lots of different um, reasons why this happens. And we're going to look at a, a, a series of case studies and get the students to start asking these questions of themselves. Um, the, the, the second topic of sort of the scandalous um, is really a catch-all phrase to get students to sign up for the class. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that that, I mean, certainly there have been cases of forgery. Von Meegeren probably high up among them that have caused great sort of commotion um, in the popular press, in newspapers, on television programs. 
Um, and this is certainly the case not only with forgery, but certainly with theft. Um, and theft is really going to be the other part of the story um, that, that we're going to try to walk through over the summer, um, which has its own very complex history of why people take things. Um, is it for financial gain? Is it for notoriety? Is it because they want those objects in their houses, that this is an aesthetic decision? Um, and you know, that too can be approached from a, a, a great diversity of, of angle. Um, but before I make that switch over to that, I want to make sure that that satiated your of course, forgery of course. desire. Are there elements of, of that that you want me to yeah, no, dive uh, deeper into or no. anything? Yeah, you did quite well. And right. um, um, uh, mm. what I was thinking with this, um, your analysis is so compelling uh, that it made me fantasize about um, and, and the following possibility. Uh, I was just in my head thinking uh, about an artist out there who has been secretly studying Van Gogh mm -hmm. for many, many years, uh, particularly Van Gogh's uh, notorious gifts of not producing many drafts, uh, but getting it right at the first time. And then this artist who's been studying Van Gogh one day gets Van Gogh's chair and the bedroom right. He produces them. And then he begins secretly selling them. The fact that he has produced them with the mastery of the motives and the chair in particular, even outwitted Van Gogh, uh, would not make the buyers, although the painting, the sheer brilliance of the mm. painting should, that they have a Van Gogh at home, mm. but rather a painting uh, on the chair or on the bedroom by this other artist mm. Mm. who is not a Van Gogh. Therefore, the product by definition, cannot be Van Gogh. One. Not because the, 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 the quality of the work is not as good as Van Gogh's would be, uh, but that the producer is not a Van Gogh. And consequently, the two art products, the bedroom in one instance and the chair in the other, can't possibly be discerned as Van Goghian. No, I just created a term. I love that word. Uh, Thank you. Can I steal that? <laughs> of course you can. Excellent. So you, your, your analysis was so compelling that I was uh, just fantasizing yeah. about this. Well, I mean, the, 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 there are two, two directions I would go with that. You know, one which I think is, I'll sort of do this in various scales of severity, um, that I think as a species we are sort of driven to find a sort of physical connection with objects that have been associated with important things or people. Right? So let's say, again, using this mug, right? if this mug sat on John F. Kennedy's desk in the Oval Office for the entirety of his presidency, right? this would be a very expensive, oops. No problem, it's only water. No, he did it well, no problem. A very expensive coffee mug, right? very expensive because it is so, I mean, the, the, the physical object itself is still $3.99 at Target. The fact that John F. Kennedy drank out of this during the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, makes this a very expensive object. Uh, signatures, uh, and there's lots and lots of people who collect autographs, baseball players, signatures of statesmen, that has nothing to do with the expense of the paper, if the signature itself is at all aesthetically pleasing, if it has wonderful curly cues and little hearts for the eyes. And I mean, it is completely divorced from any aesthetic quality, completely divorced from any sort of physical inherent expense of the material. And these signatures aren't made in gold or bronze or anything. I mean, this could be on a piece of paper and it's Babe Ruth's signature. And suddenly, for a collector, this is a very expensive thing. Um, uh, on a sort of much wider sort of philosophical scale, you could say this is why, you know, we have the cult of relics, right? Why this little sliver of wood, right. which if you believe is a sliver of wood from the true cross, that this is beyond price, right? Even though aesthetically this thing mm -hmm. costs nothing, 
It's a, it, it has absolutely no value whatsoever. Its association with something of great importance to many people makes it priceless. And so I think that a Van Gogh that isn't a Van Gogh, but it, it's got all the paint, it looks great. Everything. Feel, yeah. Everything <laughs> is great, right? Um, because you don't have that connection to exactly. the individual. Right? And you know, how we as a society determine who gets on that important list, you know, who are the figures that sort of rise up the ladder of the canon. Um, you know, it, it's in some respects a different uh, sort of conversation for us, but you know, it, you know, it has been deemed that this artist was important, is very famous, has only gotten more famous as time has gone by. The quality of the paintings, uh, you know, sort of speak for themselves. Um, but there are lots of artists who you have never heard of, and who, by extension, I have never heard of, who what? produce great work. Are we running over already? Yes, I have to shock you. Are we over? You. Do we have about full 55 minutes? three minutes left. Can you believe that? Oh and uh, I was going to ask you one big question on a in 19th minutes. century Ethiopian philosopher by the name of Zara Yaakov, uh, on which I wrote what the public uh, mm -hmm. thinks is uh, a very important book mm -hmm. um, about which there is still controversy. Would this 17th century Ethiopian philosopher genuinely Ethiopian? Or would this philosophical text that was produced in the 17th century and examined the same themes that Descartes mm -hmm. did on the nature of thinking, and they did not know each other. One lived in Ethiopia, the other one was writing from Sorbonne in Paris. And yet, scholars uncover a Canadian Jesuit uh, philosopher at the University of Addis Ababa, uncovers this unbelievable manuscript, which was 27 pages long, 67 pages long only, uh, who spoke and wrote fluent Amharic, uh, mm -hmm. Ethiopian uh, national language. Mm -hmm. And the debate over the authenticity of this mm -hmm. 17th century text is still looming large among philosophers. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to invite you again, and I'm going to devote one whole hour to the examination of this text, um, which you will um, d d d discern, not necessarily to comment on the content. It's not your specialty. You do not speak Amharic. But that as a historian, uh, how do I know? Of course <laughs> I don't. Um, as a historian, uh, so that we can uh, examine uh, issues of uh, authenticity, mm -hmm. Uh, and in this instance, too, wow. historical texts. Mm -hmm. But uh, now that um, I'm told we have two minutes left, uh, I would like you to look at the, at the camera um, and uh, uh, tell the audience uh, about the second hat that you wear, namely that you are a CEO of the uh, arts, um, arts program, the um, Pro Arts Consortium. Uh, well, I, I don't mean to um, to not answer the question that that uh, uh, that you put to me, but I, th I think that that we can sort of save that for another time yes. because I, I, I think maybe a better better maybe not the right way of putting it. Um, if you would permit me to say one quick thing about this, because now I'm fascinated about these yeah, documents. I knew you'd be. Um, <laughs> you warned me that I would be. Um, and, and you will have a chance to give me some literature on that in of advance course. of, the, uh, of yes. the next time that we do this, because uh, it also raises the, a whole series of other interesting questions, which is, is the debate over actually testing those documents, or is it a debate that says, we can't have it that an Ethiopian Correct. knew these things either before Descartes or independent of Descartes? Correct. That it's sort of, we are threatened by this African thing That's that we right. don't want to deal with, so therefore we are going to determine that they're fake. Correct. You're on the right, uh, on the right path. This has been your host, Kyodros Kiros, for African Accent. Good evening.